Hi, this is Nico Salson, and today we have an interview with Wendy Peeney. So, the first question is, when I was a teenager, I was a huge fan of Edgar Allan Poe, and also of ElfQuest, so I was very excited when I first heard about Wendy Peeney's Master of the Red Death. What inspired you to create the online comic, and are you a big Poe fan? Poe, since I was a very young girl, um, uh, in my very early teens and probably before, um, I had access, uh, my grandmother used to be a teacher, and she had a wonderful library of old, old books, some of them going back as far as the turn of uh, the previous century, and um, there were there were uh, illustrated books uh, of Edgar Allan Poe um, that really caught my imagination when I was quite young, and I just loved horror stories. I loved anything creepy. I loved, you know, when it came to fairy tales, I loved stories like Bluebeard. And, <laughs> um, and uh, I often enjoyed drawing very creepy things when I was a kid, and, and quite frankly, it, it worried my mother a lot. She, th she thought maybe I was a morbid child, but it, I just happened to be a fan of, of creepy horror. Uh, as long as it was kind of psychological, which which, again, is a characteristic of Poe. Um, I was never fond of icky, slash, slasher kinds of horror. Um, uh, anything bloody or gory wasn't my main interest. It was more uh, the sort of creepy buildup of the suspense of the story with the, pay the payoff at the end being the horrific moment, and that was something that Poe always specialized in. Yeah, I think that that pretty much is kind of what earmarks horror of that, you know, era, that it was very suspense-based. Um, yeah, and um, I also wanted to let you know that it, I started record the recording wasn't working until when you started answering, so I didn't actually record the question, but that's okay. So the next question I had was, February is Women in Horror Month, which really exists because there's still a disparity in the genre, and you're already a pioneer because you and your husband came out with Elf Quest, which, um, both because you're a woman illustrating a comic book, and also because comic books at the time didn't really have a large female following, and you had a huge female following when girls weren't supposed to be reading comic books. You already are a pioneer, but were you aware that when you took on mass that you would be kind of becoming a pioneer again because women are still underrepresented in horror? Um, that seems to be my, my nature as a creator to, uh, to try to um, go in directions that, um, that I guess you could say that women don't usually go, but that it's just because that's the way my mind works. Um, and I don't, I don't see barriers. I don't, I don't see. Um, I, I'm kind of blind to. Oh well, this, this is. Women don't usually do this. I, I don't even think in terms like that. I just, I go with what I love. Uh, and and if I'm inspired to do something, I, I'll go ahead, whether it's unusual or not. Um, and I'm delighted. I'm really delighted to to think that maybe mask is a contribution. To uh, uh, more of a, 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 a woman's presence in the creation of horror, both in a visual and a written sense, since I both, both wrote and drew Mask. Um, uh, I think that it's going to be a long time, though, before I'm actually recognized uh, for anything else but ElfQuest, and I've, I've, I've kind of resigned myself to that. I think, I think Mask's day it was a bit ahead of its time, and I think its day has yet to come. And uh, and quite possibly, uh, it will first get noticed in an entirely different genre, which would be in, in the form of musical theater, because as you know, it is being developed as, as a musical right now. Um, but but during the process of creating Mask and doing it, I had, I had some of the most creative fun I've ever had in my life. And I loved being able to do things that that for years and years I haven't been able to do in ElfQuest because we, had, we have certain parameters in ElfQuest because we're aware that we do have uh, among our regular readers is, is a younger audience. Uh, you know, parents read ElfQuest to their children. 
grandparents share it with their grandchildren. It, it's trans, it, it, it goes through generations. So um, Richard and I uh, just made the personal decision that the storytelling in ElfQuest would always remain, you know, sort of PG-13. But with Mask, I could just cut loose and do whatever I wanted, and, and uh, some of that had been building up inside me as a creator for a long, long time, and I, and I really loved having the chance to get it out of my system. Yeah, when um, I first found out about Mask, actually, I was at WonderCon in San Francisco about two years ago, and I was, I was with my dad and my niece. My dad was on, like, one of those scooter, you know, mobility scooters, and Unfortunately, he passed away in January, but um, I was... I'm so sorry to hear that, Sumika. Yeah. I'm so sorry. And, um, but me and him and my niece uh, saw the booth, and I was really excited, and, um, you know, ran up there, and my, my niece and my dad were like, you know, they were just kind of standing there, and you were like, you said, oh, um, and I was really excited to find out about Mask, and you signed my... Um, you know, one of those cards with a picture of Anton on it, and then you said that um, my niece was about 10, then you said that Mass was probably too risque for her. Um, how does erotica play into the story, and what is its intended audience? Well, um, Mask is, uh, does qualify as yaoi, and yaoi, as you may well know, is a Japanese term for boys' love comics, which means homo homo erotica. Um, and uh, it was my intention from the very beginning that Mask was going to be a graphic novel for adults only. It was going to be it was going to be quite graphic, perhaps even more graphic in certain ways than some Yaoi is when, when the focus is more on just romance. Um, I really wanted it to be hard hitting, and I, I wanted uh, readers, my adult readers, to be totally invested in the relationship of Anton and Stefan, and, and to be able to re relate to it as a totally adult relationship. I think there there are certain brands of yaoi where it it often takes place in boys' schools and 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 teenage boys just learning uh, the beginning ropes of love and love making, um, and I suppose there is a, a fascination with that in, in some circles of yaoi fandom, but um, I, I didn't even want there to be a whiff of, you know, uh, teen or, 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 or young child in mask. I wanted it to be a fully adult story for adults and to, and to really go there in terms of how graphic uh, the depiction of uh, sexual relations was. And I also decided that I wanted it to be something where anything goes. Um, so even though Mask does focus on the relationship of Anton and Stefan, which does make it uh, fall into the Yaoi category, I wanted to depict every kind of, of human sexual relationship there can be. And, and so in a sense what I was doing was everything I can't do in ElfQuest. Um, the, the people... The characters who inhabit Mask um, are creations of my own mind and spirit, and they are as as free sexually as the elves are, uh, uh, acting without labels. But um, but again, I could show, I could literally graphically show in Mask what, what I could never do in Elf Quest. And um, Mask, genre-wise, it crosses over into a few different genres because you've modernized it and set it in a, made it sort of a, a apocalyptic future fiction, maybe a little bit even uh, dystopic, although I go back and forth on that, and it's definitely a romantic tragedy as well with the story arc about, um, yeah, yeah. and um, so um, what, in t what made you decide to take the original Mask, which was a short story in the horror genre, and put it in the future and make it just sort of this broader apocalyptic story instead of just something about Prince Prospero, but just, you know, you. Well, I always had a great curiosity about Mask and particularly about the character of Prospero. Uh, when I was a, a young teen, I, I, of course, saw the Roger Corman um, Mask of the Red Death, which is an absolute classic. 
but Richard Matheson wrote that script and and uh, kind of uh, cast Prospero as a, a, a devil worshiper and, and made the excuse for all of Prospero's evil actions that he was doing this to please Satan. And so in the end, when uh, the Red Death claims him, uh, you have sort of a sense of comeuppance. But this is not what Poe wrote, and, and as a matter of fact, Poe never judged his own characters. He never had a moral at the end of the story, such as to say, well, this guy was a villain, and so he dies at the end, and, and therefore he gets his, his rightful comeuppance. Uh, Poe often said that he was not a judgmental person, and that he was not a moralist, and that you were to make of his stories what you would. And he was quite happy when there were different interpretations of what he meant. So as much as I adored the Roger Corman movie, that's not how I saw the character of Prince Prospero. I was just, I was fascinated with the idea of someone who could be, on the one hand, very generous, very wealthy, uh, wanting to show off all of all of his fabulous wealth and to and to party, and, and he was described as a very robust and, uh, you know, a laughing individual. Um, not, not in any way evil, just, just uh, very much into doing his own thing. And yet at the same time, he turns his back on the suffering of his kingdom, which is being ravaged by a plague. He does nothing to, uh, to help his dying people. And he takes a thousand of his courtiers and holds up within his own castle and parties with them while, while the rest of the kingdom dies of the plague. And I, I guess he figures that at, at one point he said, uh, we will, uh, this way we will outlast the plague, we will defeat it. And it's a very arrogant position to take. So that's the Prince Prospero I was interested in, and, and out of that I created Anton. And I came up with a backstory for him that would sort of explain how a human being could be, on the one hand, so generous and so so big in his gestures, and yet the other, on the other side of it, kind of blind to how other people feel and what they're going through. Um, makes for a very complex and interesting character. And of course, the story is really about the prince and and the and the arc that he goes through. And what I chose to do that might be slightly different from Poe is that in the end of Poe's original story, the prince dies alone in, in the black chamber. And we don't know what he felt, we don't know what his last thought was, he just drops dead. But I wanted to take my readers into the very last thoughts of the prince and, and to make them realize that at the very last moment, he, uh, he finally understands what love is. It might be too late, but at least he learns what true love is. Yeah, I thought that there was something really kind of Wuthering Heights, you know, Heathcliff uh, about him. <laughs> and um, did how were, did people react to you having, you know, two gay men as your central characters? Did it create any controversy, and how did the public receive it? Oh, it was interesting at first. Um, you know, uh, my my original publisher, Go Call Me, uh, uh, my two publishers were um, David Wise and Audrey Taylor, who founded this uh, uh, small uh, company, and, and they brought over uh, quite a number of manga titles uh, to, um, you know, they, they actually were, for a little while there, competing with Tokyo Pop and this, and other uh, publishers like that that were translating manga into English, and they were doing a really bang-up job of it. And uh, I discussed with them that I had all, you know, I had had this idea for Mask for a long time, and it would be Wendy Peeney does a Yaoi, and they got excited about that. And they, they knew something of the Yaoi market and, and how to present it. And um, so I was really helped along by uh, David and Audrey in getting Mask started, in, in launching it as an animated webcomic which again was another bit of pioneering uh, because the, the webcomic flash player had to kind of be created from scratch so that people could either page through it and read it like uh, from frame to frame or they could just hit auto and it would play like a movie. 
And I was essentially creating a three-minute movie every week. Out of uh, I would I would draw four pages a week, and then I would uh, break it down into uh, panels, and I would turn those panels into flash movie frames, and and put those into the flash player, and then do all the various animation tricks I had to do uh, to get it to play as a short film. So uh, you know I basically had no life for four years. I you know uh, I would I would finish up on Friday and maybe take Saturday off just to recuperate, and then I would start all, all over again on Sunday. Um, but it was a wonderful experience. Um, and as far as reactions, uh, the first thing that surprised us was that not very many uh, ElfQuest fans followed me to mask. And uh, what really surprised me about that is that there is so much ElfQuest slash fiction out there. And uh, slash fan art. Uh, there's just tons of it all over the web. And, and the fans have been very open uh, all these years about their fantasies of uh, different male elves um, having a same-sex relationship. And, uh, and of course, in ElfQuest, we went as far with, with that as we could dare hint at. Um, but I thought they would be delighted to see Wendy Keeney just go full gusposo with graphic erotica, and that wasn't really the case. Because ElfQuest fans wanted to see elves doing it, they didn't necessarily want to see new characters or, or get to know them, or, or or see characters that weren't necessarily as as nicely behaved as the elves were. Uh, I mean, my version of Mask certainly contains characters that behave very very badly, but that's part of the story. <laughs> So, so uh, not a lot of ElfQuest fans took to Mask right away. It's it's been a growing process, and it's still growing to this day. Um, Mask is almost five years old now, and uh, there there are people who are only discovering it just now. I experienced um, even a little resistance from the gay community. Uh, some very early reviews of Mask that came out f from various gay websites were really against the way it was drawn, um, and, and I suspect these reviews were written by people who didn't know too much about Yaoi or how delicately and effeminate a lot of the um, males in Yaoi are actually drawn. Um, so, so gay guys who did these reviews, who sort of preferred theirs, thought the artwork looked awful. <laughs> so not only did I get a kind of disinterest from the ElfQuest community, but I also got a little backlash from from the gay community for the way it was drawn. Um, but I, I don't think it was... I, there wasn't too much of that, is, is what I will say. Um, Mask just slowly and surely began to build a following of people who got involved with their relationship. They, they really got into what was going to happen to Anton and Stefan, and, and uh, a lot of people were very hopeful that it would have a happy ending, and I kept telling them, hey, this is Poe. I mean, don't, don't even begin to work for a happy ending. <laughs> but people were, like, really rooting for them, and, and as the story came towards an end, you know, there were a lot of people that were just on the edge of their seats wondering if one or the both of them was going to survive. Yeah, I think I'm one of those people that didn't find out about it until three years after it was done. Yeah. And um, speaking of Poe and how dark Poe is and um, things, um, one thing about your adaptation, which I think in some ways was actually even darker than Poe, um, <laughs> yeah, just, just because the scope of it, I mean, Prince Prospero died and he ignored his, you know, local village or local city, but... This is the whole world, so, um, you know, and this is, a, my blog is a horror blog, so, um, you know, the thing is that you're writing in, um, sort of a sci-fi horror, uh, combination here, and you've got a lot of definitely apocalyptic, uh, imagery going on there, but, um, I noticed that there is a class divide really in your story where the wealthy are able to purchase extensions for life and the class division seems, you know, broader maybe even than it is now in the present and that's kind of like a dystopia but I'm, like I said I never could really figure out do you consider it to be a, a dystopic 
future or not really? I think that's a great question because I would say subtly dystopic. Um, the, the society that I created for Mask has actually solved a lot of the world's ills. Uh, in other words, on the plus side, they have used science to solve the problems of disease and famine and even war. Uh, you know, uh, Anton refers to them in the earliest pages of the story as the old embarrassments. You know, <laughs> famine, disease, war, all these things that, that we, uh, you know, currently are, are uh, wrestling with in, in the most difficult way. They have solved those, and they've also learned how to prolong life through nanotechnology. But there is definitely a, a class system there where, where it's the most wealthy who can afford uh, uh, the best quality nanos to, to pro prolong their lives. And um, there is a worker, sort of a worker bee society, which Daryl represents, that's actually pretty content. You know, he grew up on, on a, a fancy high-tech farm and he has known uh, a certain kind of comfort all his life. He has never been fabulously wealthy, but he's never aspired to that. He's, he's a young man who has uh, led a pretty contented life and enjoys his work, and, um, you know, he has a very optimistic vision of the world, except that he can sort of sense that it's getting overly te technological. So I use Daryl as my Jiminy Cricket throughout the story. He's the one that makes the little side comments every now and then, suggesting that things are, are kind of on the verge of getting out of control. They're not out of control yet, but they're on the verge. And he, he just sort of gives little warnings here and there throughout the story. And in the end, he finally blows up at Anton and, and says, when the hell are you going to wake up? When are you really going to get it? That, that whether you meant it or not, you're responsible for this. And, and that's the thing. I think I think when things go really, really wrong, when uh, you know nuclear, uh, the, those big nuclear insta installations have something go wrong, you, you know everybody is like, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, and nobody really wants to take responsibility. But but uh, I think that's a very powerful message in the story that in the end the buck has to stop somewhere, whether you intended it or not. If you create something that can get that wildly out of control, maybe you should think twice before you actually create it. Um, I, I could relate that to a line in uh, the first Jurassic Park movie where Jeff Goldblum says uh, that science was so preoccupied with, with what they could do that they never stopped to think about whether they should. And this is, this is, this is a great uh, way to characterize Anton. Anton creates atomons because he can. But he thinks that simply by telling Stefan, we're going to keep this a secret amongst ourselves and we're never going to release this to the public because we too are the only ones brilliant enough to ever uh, make sure that atomons will remain perfectly safe. You know, he's arrogant enough to think that. And then, of course, the story progresses as it does, and the formula leaks out, and it gets abused. And ultimately, you know, whether he intended it or not, the prince must take responsibility for that. Um, mask, your mask is definitely a very tragic story, and I was wondering, do you, as is the original um, Poe mask, but I was wondering, do you think that most horror has an element of tragedy to it? Only if you care about the characters. Um, I think that uh, Poe, the only character who's really delineated at all in Mask is the prince. And uh, Poe does not sketch him in such a way that you care about him as a person. You, you can learn certain things about him, that he's, that he's arrogant, that he thinks that he can escape from the plague and, and protect his followers within his castle, so we learn that he's arrogant, mm -hmm. and so at the end when he dies, you you may have a certain vague sense that the prince receives his comeuppance, and on the other hand, you may feel a little sorry for him and for his people, but um, 
But what you're left with in the original Poe story more than anything else is the absolute creepiness of this of this tone poem, this this picture he has painted of how the de- Red Death gets in and how it takes over. And then in the end, there is nothing but the dominion of the Red Death. And, and so you have this horrible feeling of doom and like there was never a way out from the very beginning. So is that tragedy or is that just super, super creepy doom and and uh, end, of, end of the world kind of feeling that you're left with? But I don't think you're left with a lot of sorrow at the end of Poe's story. My intention was that I wanted, I really wanted to make people cry. You know, I wanted people totally invested in Anton and Stefan, like, like you might get invested in Kathy and Heathcliff of Wuthering Heights, which you brought up a few minutes ago. Uh, these are two lovers who are absolutely perfect for each other in every way, except they simply cannot get along. They can't agree on anything, and you're rooting on, you're rooting for them. You want them to get along because you can see they're perfect for each other if they can get over their problems. But in in classic tragedy, it's always a question of timing. Just when it looks like they might be able to come together, Stefan makes one last mistake, you know, which which is injecting burial with adamant, and if he hadn't done that, Anton was on the verge of forgiving him. But, but but this is a tragedy, and in tragedy, timing is everything. And Stephen's timing was what led to led to the end of all things, basically. And I wanted people to feel very sad about that, almost like they would say, "Oh my God, they missed each other by just that much." You know, if not if not for that one last fatal mistake they might have ended up together and they might have been able to do something about the plague. So, yeah, that's that's the feeling I wanted my readers to be left with. Okay, so um, uh, one last thing which doesn't have that much to do with horror, but speaking of controversy, um, there was some type of hoopla about um, Bunch appearing topless on Facebook. And what did you think about that? And does it surprise you that nudity is so much more taboo, you know, taboo really than violence or anything else even like... No, 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 no. It didn't surprise me for one bit that nudity and sexuality is more taboo than violence because years ago, thir- you know, 25, 30 years ago, uh, ElfQuest came under fire for having, you know, the famous orgy scene in issue 17, the f- <laughs> and, and believe me, this is the mildest, gentlest orgy that's ever been put, <laughs> put forth visually, but nevertheless, it, there, there was, uh, you know, some real hue and cry about it, and par- some parents really strongly objected, and there were articles about it, you know, should we or shouldn't we have done this? But nobody seemed to notice that also in that very same issue, the elves were, were killing trolls and hacking wounds off and turning faces into hamburger, and that didn't bother anybody. You know, the violence in the story, <laughs> nobody worried about that a bit. It was the sexuality. So we learned that, Richard and I learned that lesson 30 years ago, that in America there is this prudish, Streak where violence is perfectly okay, but but sexuality uh, is is taboo. Um, so um, getting back getting back to your original question of uh, bunch, um, the thing that I did learn that I didn't know before is that Facebook has uh, people that patrol it all over the world. Uh, th- there are guys in Ireland. There are guys, and I say guys, you know, they're men and women, in India, China, America, Australia, all over, who patrol Facebook pages for uh, what is considered unacceptable material. And yet, in each of these regions, there's a different level of what's acceptable. For, For example, in India, any kind of homoerotic imagery is an absolute no no. Whereas in Australia, they wouldn't be as hung up about that. But it, it seems that, that the thing they go after the most frequently is bare female nipples. Um, 
unless it's, you know, a work of art, say, by Michelangelo or Da Vinci, uh, uh, which uh, I suppose they, they make the excuse that that falls into the classic art category. Any other kind of art that depicts that very often gets censored. And, um, and so I got censored because they thought Bunch was a full female, even though Bunch is a hermaphrodite or, or um, actually called transgender, um, uh, which means Bunch is both male and female, and, and Bunch is tiny. I mean, you know, Bunch doesn't really have boobs, but Bunch has nipples, and it was the nipples that were the problem. <laughs> but in all in all, uh, it worked out amazingly well for me because it drew a huge number of uh, hits to the Mask of the Red Death Facebook page. I think we, uh, that week that the Bunch controversy happened, when, when uh, it got censored, uh, uh, I think we had 52,000 new views on the Mask Facebook page. So... <laughs> So if I had a troll who was reporting me, uh, I can only thank that troll for for just bringing a lot more attention to Mask and getting us some new likes and uh, maybe some new readers. Okay, so it's been really nice talking to you, and before we wrap this up, is there anything else you'd like our readers to know that we haven't covered yet? Well, um, there are two sides to me as a creator. Um, there are some elements of horror in ElfQuest. Uh, we did do some things that were, you know, kind of scary and dark in ElfQuest. Uh, but for the most part, ElfQuest is a work of light. It's uh, it's an attempt to portray humanoid science fictional fantasy characters treating each other from their best impulses, you know, treating each other as well as we wish human beings might treat each other. But in Mask of the Red Death, uh, it's my work of darkness, and I wanted to go down as deep into the dark as I possibly could with the story. And um, it's a kind of a delicious darkness. There, there is a side of me that just adores horror, as long as it's in the sort of suspenseful psychological horror category, uh, mixed with a little bit of, of gore at the end. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I do consider myself uh, part fantasy artist-writer and part horror artist-writer with a tinge of romance. Um, so those are the two sides of me. Okay, thank you very much for um, the interview.